Hello and welcome to the Actual Tech Media EcoCast. My name is Jess and I am excited to be here with you all today. But before we jump into our content, I have some basic information that I want to cover with you. All right, let's kick off our day here today by taking a quick tour of your audience console. And we're going to start with the questions window. So if you haven't already said hi, there is a whole audience of cool humans out there. So reach out and give a wave to the other members of the actual tech media community. Now, keep in mind that if you do have any technical issues today, a browser refresh is going to fix just about anything. But if those tech gremlins are clinging on today, no problem. Just throw a comment in the question section and our crew will be there to help. We also want this to be an informative webinar for you. So throughout today's EcoCast, we hope you'll get engaged and ask all your burning questions. Not only will we have team members responding to you over a live chat, we will also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of our presentations. Now, if we don't get to your question during the live webinar today, don't worry because the awesome experts that we have here with us will be following up after we wrap. All right, next up, there's going to be lots of cool aha moments on the EcoCast today. And if you want to share those with your community, we've made it nice and easy for you. You can use the Twitter button right there on your audience console and the hashtag for today's EcoCast will be automatically added to your post. All right, our last stop on this guided tour, be sure to check out the handouts tab for some awesome resources and takeaways from our speakers here today. We have an info pack collection, solution briefs, white papers, data sheets, free trials, eBooks, upcoming webinars, and more. So many great resources, so be sure to go explore. Now, if that wasn't enough fun, we also have some exciting prizes that we'll be giving away throughout today's EcoCast. I'm gonna tell you a bit more about those later on, but a few quick reminders for you all. First, you do need to be here live in attendance at the EcoCast in order to qualify to win a prize. And we will follow up with all of you after we wrap. Now, all winners must submit an IRS form W9 to Actual Tech Media, and all winners must meet the Actual Tech Media prize terms and conditions. Now, if you don't know what those full T's and C's are, that's fine. We've got the full thing for you. Just head on over to that handouts tab, click in, scroll down to the bottom, and you'll find them waiting for you there. Now, the absolute most important thing to remember is that we love getting all your insightful questions during these live webinars. In fact, we love it so much that we actually have a special additional prize for all you inquisitive folks out there. So in today's EcoCast, we will be giving away a prize for the best question asked in each of our live sessions. Now, the expert speakers and teams will review all questions asked after we wrap the webinar, which means that even if your question does not get read out in a live session, there is still a chance to win. If you are a lucky winner here today and you would like to donate the value of your prize, we have several wonderful organizations that we partner with. So let us know when we follow up about your big win and we'll get that rolling for you. Again, we are so happy to have you all here with us live at the EcoCast today and we want to keep that good feeling going so let's connect on social media. Reach out and connect with Actual Tech Media on Twitter and on LinkedIn. We have lots of great content and we always want to hear from you. Now, if you're looking for more awesome content and resources right after we wrap the EcoCast today, be sure to subscribe to the Actual Tech Media channel on YouTube. Another fun way to win a prize and, hey, grow this awesome community is to refer an industry friend or a coworker to the Actual Tech Media webinar series. Now, you'll find a link to do that right in your handouts tab, and you will also be automatically redirected at the end of the webinar. And both you and your coworker or friend could win a prize, and we hold those drawings every month. So be sure to refer a friend because, it, hey, it could quite literally be a win-win situation. Next, we have a cool opportunity for all the decision makers out there to get connected with new and emerging tech and innovative vendors. Here's how it works. All you need to do is click on the link in your handouts tab, fill out a quick application, and the actual tech crew will then match you with some vendors that we think you should probably be chatting with based on your needs. There will also be fun opportunities that you get to choose to join in, like surveys, test runs, uh, new solutions, extended demos, and so on. You'll get some chances to win extra prizes, you'll chat with great people, and you'll learn about the hottest new trends in tech. So be sure to apply, or hey, send that link to a decision maker on your team. Now I wanna take a quick minute here to remind you all about one of my favorite resources and that is ransomware.org. You can find out everything you need to know about ransomware, how to prepare, prevent, and recover. This site is jam-packed with information, helpful tips, checklists, strategic approaches, case studies, everything you need in one place. So wherever you are in your ransomware preparedness journey, there is something for you at ransomware.org. Go check it out and start exploring. 
All right, I have one more exciting resource I have to tell you about today, and that is the Gorilla Guide Book Club. It's going to give you access to free enterprise IT books authored by top industry experts. So you can stay up to date on trending enterprise technology. And yes, these books will work on your Kindle, your mobile device, and as I said, they are completely free. You can download these awesome resources at gorilla.guide, and there's a link for you in that handouts tab as well. All right, well, we have covered a lot of important things already, and I don't know about you all, but I am excited to dive in. So let's get going. I agree with you 100%, Jess. Let's dive in and get going. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Actual Tech Media Ecocast. Today's topic is securing and optimizing custom applications on premises or in the cloud. I want to start by saying a big thank you for joining us today on the Ecocast. We have got two uh, great, innovative, and amazing companies, uh, OpSWAT and Rubrik. So get ready for some great learning today. Uh, I am Keith Ward with Actual Tech Media, and I am thrilled to be your moderator for this special Ecocast today. Other Mod Squad members include Mackenzie Putasi, Scott Becker, and Jess Steinbach, who you've already heard from. And as always on our Ecocast, it's not just awesome content you get, but you get some great prizes too. Today, that includes three $300 Amazon gift cards. So three of you are going to go uh, out of here today a little bit richer. If that sounds good, just stick around. And with that, folks, I am ready to start this off with a discussion with my good friend, Dan Sullivan. Now, Dan is a very experienced cloud architect and author, and we are lucky to have him with us to discuss ways to secure and optimize custom apps in the modern era. Dan is ready to go, so I am going to bring him in right now. Hi, Dan. It is great to have you here as always. Now, today we are talking about securing and optimizing custom applications on premises or in the cloud. So let's dive right in with the first question, okay? Okay, great. Looking for you are you are always ready and eager to talk. So first up today for you, Dan, why is it harder than ever to secure and optimize custom applications. We know it's changed. We know things aren't the way they used to be, but why has it become so much harder these days? Well, really there's there's multiple dimensions or types of problems we're dealing with here. I mean, there are sort of the things we've known about for a long time, like advanced persistent threats, ransomware attacks, but now there are other factors emerging like AI enhanced attacks and just the volume of attacks. The We still have things like zero day vulnerabilities and now people are, malicious actors are able to exploit those even faster. So part of the issue is there are different ways of attacking and also the acceleration and the pace at which we are attacked is a problem. And custom applications create a great attack surface. They, they can be vulnerable if they're not securely designed. And very often, I, I I think I would be fairly safe in saying that developers are much more aware of baking in security to their applications than they used to be. Back in the early days when you and I started in IT, it, for a lot of developers, it was kind of an afterthought, wasn't it? It doesn't seem that way, but there are still issues. I agree. Absolutely. I think people have gotten the idea that, you know, design, security design starts when design starts and it's part of the entire process. And it's, you know, that it is just it's pervasive. And I think that is definitely true. I think so. Our mindset, I agree. I think, you know, we as developers and architects, our mindset is more attuned to security now. But the complexity of the systems that we design, the fact that we have so much exposed through APIs, the, you know, as we mentioned, the acceleration of attacks and the, the things like zero day vulnerabilities make it even more complicated. So, so what we carry at, in terms of responsibility as developers and architects is much more in security, you know, the, there's many more responsibilities we carry as architects and developers now. And so we need a better tools. We need additional tools as well as our, the shift in our frame of, of mind around security. So we need those, we need additional help to keep, 
keep up with just the pace of security threats. We need help. And I think we're going to talk about that a little bit more in this. So um, let me ask you another question that uh, that's on a lot of admins and CISOs minds, people who are involved in security. Uh, security also can really affect optimization. So too much security, defense in depth, for example, is a concept that people need to be doing. But if, you're, if you're, your firewall and your other things are doing so much analysis, packet analysis and other things, can't that slow down the optimization process? It, it can. It definitely can. And there are things that, you know, really good practices like logging, they're really important that we do. But if we do too much logging, we're going to, you know, basically slow down the system. We're going to drive up our IOPS, you know, rates and things like that. And, and that'll take IOPS away from, you know, things we want, like features functionality within the application. So there's really a balancing act between security and performance. And so we don't want to sacrifice things like encryption or the use of firewalls or things like web application firewalls. So one of the the tricks is to reduce the amount of work that we're doing in our application for unnecessary or malicious activity. So for example, things like a web application firewall can filter out a lot of traffic that might not be legitimate traffic. So not expending resources on malicious traffic is one way to kind of make sure our resources are efficiently used. And then there are other things like how we design our systems to use you know, encryption efficiently, use web application firewalls efficiently, and make sure we tune things like our logging. Finding that balance too, Dan, can can take quite a while. I mean, it's not like you set up your environment and then you assume there's, you know, that you've you've got enough balance between security and optimization. I mean, it's something that needs continual kind of analysis and tweaking, doesn't it? Oh, it does. I mean, you constantly need to monitor. Logging, monitoring, and tracing are really sort of the key pillars of observability. And from a security perspective, as well as an optimization perspective, we need to know where where our weak spots are. And just because, you know, we might've had a performance issue in one service as part of our our application, you know, last week, that doesn't mean that's where the performance bottleneck is today. We're constantly seeing changes in our traffic patterns and the use cases in which, you know, our applications are used. So we need a lot of information, really constant information, feed of information. So we need to be able to observe and we need to be able to kind of alert when, you know, something's out of sync. Like, why is there a spike in this traffic? Or are we, you know, suddenly rate limiting, you know, a handful of customers on a, you know, small set of API keys, what's going on there? So yeah, we need to be able to know, like in near real time, what's happening and where the performance bottlenecks are. Okay. So staying on this theme though, um, there's, you know, there's networks, there's applications, there's data. Now, of course they are all connected, but what I want to talk about now is the biggest security threats to applications specifically right now, not just on the network level, but on the application level. What do you see, since you're doing this day after day, what are the biggest security threats to applications that you find? Well, you know, I think, you know, some of the the big areas are broken access controls. So not, you know, not doing role-based access control or identity management correctly. That's that's a big problem. Um, Injection attacks. Anytime you have a database or even other applications where we're accepting user input, we really need to have to have to validate that. We just as a general rule, we should just trust nothing, you know, no, no input, no requests for connections, you know, similarly, like a call to an API, you know, that should be validated with either something like a a bearer token to be sure we understand who is, you know, if that person is authenticated to do that particular operation. Um, Also from an availability perspective, you know, we want to make sure we understand who's using this so we can rate limit them appropriately. Um, So, you know, other vulnerabilities in addition to things like the injection attacks and broken access controls, are just, you know, broken um, encryption, you know, like our encryption is not working. So either weak encryption or misconfigured encryption. So we might, you know, 
have data leaks because of that. Um, and then, you know, poor system design. Applications are getting more and more complex. So I should take that. It's not poor design. It's challenging to design securely at this level of complexity that we're working at today. And it's, as you pointed out, things have changed since, you know, we started. And it's much more difficult now than it was, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. And so I think, you know, while we have gotten more into thinking about security early in the design phase, there's much more we need to think about. And we need to depend on others because the pace at which threats change, we as developers can't keep up with all of those things. We need to leverage people who specialize and focus on that and build tools, whether it's web application firewalls or, or other tools that are, are like vulnerability scanning tools. Anything that's going to help us kind of control the attack surface and mitigate the risks are going to help us in, in sort of with the, these threats. A hundred percent. Okay. Um, last question for you today. And this kind of harkens back to my um, journalism days as an editor, magazine editor, uh, writer and all that. I love lists, right? Um, listicles are fun. Everybody loves lists, right? You can't, you can't see a good list on the internet somewhere and not <laughs> click on it. So, so, so I'm going to ask for Dan Sullivan's list today. Uh, I want you to give me, Dan, your three, your top three application optimization tips. Oh, I would say number one is don't do work you have to do. So use use any tics, tricks you have available to block traffic, like minimize, filter out traffic early that's coming in maybe to your API or your application. So again, that could be things like web application firewalls or firewalls. So that would be number one. I would say with regards to um, performance, you want to make sure that you are constantly logging and monitoring because again, the the environment we work in is very dynamic. Our traffic, our workloads are dynamic. We need to understand where our bottlenecks are. So if we want better performance, we have to know where we're having performance problems. So monitoring and logging is another one. And then I would say also for application developers um, that depend, that use databases, and there are different kinds. There's uh, several kinds of NoSQL databases, relational databases, analytical. They're all different. They're tuned differently. Make sure you know we're not spending too much time and too many resources on inefficient database operations. Unfortunately, there are, there are a lot of tools for targeting, identifying those bottlenecks, and correcting them. So oh. I would say those would be my top three. The top three. Okay. <laughs> thank you for that list, Dan. Um, and thank you for uh, for joining us today. That's about all we've got time for. I want to thank you as always, Dan, for your insightful information, for educating us on this crucial topic. As always, it's been a delight to spend some time with you. Thanks, Keith. This has been a, I really enjoyed the conversation. Me too. I always enjoy my discussions with Dan. Uh, as you've seen, he is so amazingly knowledgeable. I think we would all agree. Okay, next up, folks, I've got a poll question for you. Let us know your time frame for adding new or updating existing IT solutions at your company. We are certainly in an age of big change right now, um, and it's good to find out where you are in your journey. These kinds of questions are really important for us to get your feedback on, so please keep voting in that poll. We've got feedback coming in right now, as I typically see a lot of you are still not sure when you're gonna be making those changes. Uh, the options here are zero to six months, six months to a year, one to two years, and not sure. So keep voting in that for another few moments uh, while we get ready for our first presentation in the EcoCast. That is coming up here in just moments. So why don't we get to that? And thanks once again for voting. This, this feedback is so valuable and important to us. So we always appreciate that. And with that, uh, I would I am happy to introduce our first presentation, and that is from OpsWat. And presenting for OpsWat today is George Prickich, Vice President of Product. George, welcome to the EcoCast today. It is a delight to have you here. Are you ready to go, sir? Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, I'm ready. Absolutely. Well, then you have the virtual mic. Take it away. 
Thank you very much for the opportunity. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. I'll try to quickly go through a presentation about what we're doing here at Opsot and our focus on Mad Defender for file security. And I'll explain how that works in a second. But real quick, an introduction about who we are. Opsot has been around for 20 years. We have over 1,700 customers in the critical infrastructure of verticals. And this is how DHS defines it with like 16 different verticals. We have a very strong presence in BFSI, in banking, in financial, but also like almost all nuclear facilities, almost all nuclear reactors actually in the country are using us to protect their that transfer and so on and so forth. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we also have a presence globally, not just in um, US. You see our, our offices here. We have R&D centers around the world and support centers to cover around the sun 24 seven support. Uh, so what our mission for my group is to prevent file-borne threats. Our mission as a company is protecting the world's critical infrastructure. So um, what we are focusing on is to protect your file exchanges, let's call it that way. So that can be file uploads. We have like eight out of top 10 banks in the US using us for file uploads, file downloads, also like integrations with your MFT products, your file transfer, but also file sharing and SaaS products that are being used to like exchange files with your customers, partners, and so on. Now, one of the things that uh, we focus on is that when we're, it's coming, when we're discussing about protecting web applications specifically, for instance, and the file upload, um, component is the fact that malware still bypasses traditional way of detecting and preventing malware as well. And that can be anti-malware if you're using only one AV, sandboxes, webs, and so on. A lot of these tools were not actually meant to act, uh, detect files as they're coming in in a static detection perspective. So one of the things that we're looking at slightly different is how we can actually offer a better experience, a full end-to-end -end solution for you to be able to like not just detect, but also prevent these malicious attacks, right? And that can mean multiple things, right? Just using one um, anti malware vendor to be able to detect and tick that box might be good enough for compliance, but will not be good enough for you to actually be able to have a secure solution in place, right? And I'm insisting on this one because static analysis, what you're seeing when you're scanning the files versus dynamic analysis, like what that uh, solution can deliver by protecting your endpoint are slightly different. And then we're looking a lot more deeper on different angles of like an analyzing the file. And that can mean multiple things from actually um, sanitizing a file means that if a file contains macro, it doesn't have to be a malicious macro, but if you're accepting, let's say, an um, insurance claim, and that one is a JavaScript in your PDF form, that is a problem, right? Maybe that JavaScript shouldn't be there in the first place. So we're able to remove that one. Macros from Office Suite and so on and so forth, any kind of scripts and so on. But also hyperlinks, that's not something the AV vendors are focusing on and we have solutions for that as well. So we're, we offer a suite of technologies to augment the detection and prevention when it comes to um, protecting those files. We can discuss that in a second and then we'll discuss a bit more on how we can actually tie that back to like protecting your applications as well. So real quick going through um, the technology stack, when uh, we're discussing multi-scanning, we build uh, one of the most powerful multi-scanning solutions in the world. We have over 30 anti malware vendors as part of our portfolio, but the important distinction here is that the, there's a real-time endpoint protection. The endpoint security products have been built to protect the endpoint, not just to do static file scanning. And that is more or more of a focus and the bigger focus is to protect the endpoints, right? And we're talking about files, uh, like static scanning, that detection ratio drops a lot. And that's why we build a multi-scanning solution for us to be able to crowdsource the intelligence from all these vendors, right? And we have over 30 anti malware vendors as part of our portfolio, combining from like um, machine learning AI engines to signature-based heuristics and so on. Um, this can run in your environment, no data gets, um, send back to our cloud or their cloud and so on, no information sharing, no files sharing and so on. It can be full privacy. Um, and this is something that's very powerful to actually get as close as possible as like 100% when it comes to detection. So our full um, max package that can actually has all the engines, it's over 99% uh, detection when it comes to like known and some unknown threads as well. And the way it works is like we've built Mad Defender a platform as an analysis pipeline. And this is one of the stages in that pipeline, one of the stages of the analysis. And as the file are passing through, we're analyzing that file for malicious content and reporting what each of the vendors is saying about that uh, thread or not. The next one is deep CDR. And this is actually a very interesting concept. It's prevention that doesn't rely on detection. And what that means actually we're doing the technologies 
content disarmony construction means that we're looking at the file structure of a file and we decide what is compliant for your business or not. So if you're deciding for one use case, one data entry channel, let's call it, let's say you have a web portal, part of your KYC as a bank, you're accepting files from your end users, they're uploading, I know, a picture of their ID, as an example, you define what is accepted out of that, right? So if you don't want to accept, again, macros in an um, office suite or, uh, let's say, Word, Excel files and so on, don't want to accept JavaScript in PDFs, all the objects, ITV controls and so on and so forth. Any object that might drive a malicious behavior, um, that's something we're able to remove. So we're looking at the file structure and based on that, and your policy, we define what are the objects we're going to keep and we're always going to provide a safe to consume copy, right? So it's risk-free. It's that, again, I hate buzzwords, but it's that zero trust uh, mindset where you need to like trim it down to the things that you actually can consume. You don't need that complexity uh, in most of the use cases, especially when you're working with untrusted sources and so on. You don't need to accept macros from the outside. You don't need to accept JavaScript in these office suites, I don't know, even an AutoCAD JavaScript automation and so on and so forth. And that's the bit we're able to like remove that risk from the file and provide like a sanitized copy. And uh, what happens behind the scene, again, we're looking at the file structure. We keep only the objects that are relevant, especially the content that gets moved in a brand new file. So we reconstruct that file and we're providing the sanitized copy. In the same time, we give you also like an audit trail on how, what exactly we sanitized, what exactly was removed, what exactly was rebuilt and so on. And we can do that actually in archives as well, in complex file types where we actually rebuild the entire thing. So you can actually have a PDF in an Excel that's embedded in a Word. We can go to the entire chain and sanitize the entire chain. And this is something that's quite fast. It's roughly a second per file, depending on how many files you have, let's say in an archive and so on. You see here like 12 seconds for roughly 12 files as well. So um, that's something that's very important when you're looking at like speed, you don't want to keep your end users waiting, but at the same time to remove the risk from the file as well. And the next one would be actually adaptive sandbox. And this is something that's very important and key for us as well, because it gives you the full picture of what's going on. So if you're, uh, you're able to configure, for instance, to trigger the sandbox analysis, if the file has a macro in it as well, for you to understand the behavior of the macro. But equally important is, like I said before, malicious hyperlinks, right? I can put, let's say, there's some, there are so many sources out there for like phishing in an email body. The not so many that are for like phishing URLs in like in a PDF or hidden in an archive that's password protected uh, and so on, and they cannot even extract that information um, at some point. So like we have flaws on how to achieve that one. And what the data sandbox is doing is that we're actually emulation based, not VM based. So that means that we don't need to have run a fleet of VMs for us to be able to analyze. We're able to actually extract the scripts per se and execute them um, and emulate its entire behavior. So instead of relying on the fingerprint of the system, meaning like uh, there are so many more armoring things out there, but as easy example as, hey, if you have like, um, let's say, a malware sample that's going to detonate at only at 3 a.m. in the morning or after you've made seven clicks and uh, pressed three times the key, the, uh, the A key on the keyboard and so on, that's the only time we're going to detonate. Well, we don't need to go through that exercise and do all the combinations possible, we can actually see what's the expectation because we control, we have adaptive flow control and we can go through each of the branches, if then else kind of behavior, we can go through each of the branches until we get to the malicious payload, execute that one, extract the IOCs, right? So it's very powerful that we don't need to rely on like what actually a VM can tell us with golden images. We don't have to mimic user behavior, don't have to mimic that user machine as well. We can actually just execute the code and focus on that execution to extract the IOCs. And that's very important because if there's a file that's being dumped, we're going to go and analyze that as well. We're going to follow the hyperlinks, we're going to follow the redirects and so on, and we get you a full analysis, right? So what we're trying to achieve is like a full malware detection and prevention, encompassing or like combining multiple technologies, right, to achieve the end flow where we're trying to, I don't know, build kind of like a funnel for us to like, um, move as fast as possible, analyze as fast as possible, and filter as much as possible with traffic so only the relevant files to be detonated in the sandbox for you to have a fast response. In the same time, think about technology-wise, the multi-scanning is under one second per file, the CDR is roughly one second per file, the sandbox is 20 to 30 seconds, right? So the more we're filtering with the multi-scanning and the CDR, the less... Um, would go actually to the sandbox. So probably if I would put, let's say a million files you get a day, you shouldn't get more than even a thousand might be a bit much of like JavaScript in PDF macros and so on to analyze. 
Now the next, uh, like quick, one quick thing, we have um, kind of like uh, an integration that allows us to use the sandbox as a detection capability with an, um, a very brief report on like what was uh, detected and why it was blocked, but also you can actually access the full report and get access to IOCs, share that with your um, IR team, your security team, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, real quick, another technology I want to like quickly uh, discuss is our proactive DLP solution as well, where we're actually able to not just detect credit card numbers, social security numbers, and so on. Sorry, let me go go back, um, but also we're able to redact that information as well, right? So that's another important thing to mention where it's not just data in, but it's also data out. And this is something that grew a lot uh, for us as well, also as part of the data leakage with the Gen AI usage and so on. So there's a lot of interest on in how to achieve DLP capabilities as well, not just for the uh, consuming the data, but especially like data going out and how you train your models and so on, on what data. Um, the training and also the prompt side as well. So I'll, uh, we have a lot of things to discuss here, um, but in a nutshell, this diagram looks very busy. Um, normally we have like animations to walk you through, but I'll just, I want to give you one quick uh, blimp of like what we're able to do. So when it comes to like file uploads, uh, you can follow along with um, uh, the story, but like the users can upload a file through that WAF with F5, A10, Nginx and so on. Right, that can actually front face um, some web services, and those web services can call our API or can integrate through the ICAP to uh, our platform. Or if a user uploads a file in a managed file transfer solution at the bottom as well, and we integrate with all of those mostly through ICAP or through API integration, or an application dumps the file directly in a storage solution, being in the cloud or on prem, we can integrate with those as well. And equally important, we can integrate with SaaS products as well as the files are uploading in an exchange through SaaS products as well. And for that, we have the management platform and different products that allow us to have a full integration as well, um, being either through non-protocols or through like native APIs, right? So when I say native protocols, that can be, again, like I said, ICAP, S3 API became almost of a protocol these days, Samba, NFS, SFTP, and so on and so forth, right? So we are able to integrate through all that, but at the same time, we have native integrations um, with the likes of, again, being um, Box, being OneDrive, SharePoint, and so on and so forth, Salesforce, you name it. So the entire idea is that we build this management platform to like analyze the files, sanitize them, provide the analysis, a full analysis, um, for the file and then provide the enforcement as part of your flows. And one of the things that I'm really happy with is that we have a way for us to actually hook into the way you're doing your existing workflow. So you don't have to change your workflows. You don't have to go and build new integrations. You don't have to change your application flow and so on to adapt uh, these technologies. We're able to hook in the existing flows and add a security layer on top of it. So that means like minimal changes on your end, uh, faster adoption of our technologies, let's say, to be able to consume them and resolve your problems as well. And this is something that grew a lot for us. And that's why we're building a lot more of these connectors, so to speak, is because we have a lot more demand, especially in cloud and SaaS uh, environments as well. Now, a quick thing to mention, we have uh, some of our customers that uh, provide like public testimonials. I'm gonna highlight a few of them. We have Zoom that's using actually our technology as part of the release management cycle. So whenever they release, and probably some of you are actually using Zoom on a daily basis, whenever you install a new version of the Zoom client, you should know that that's actually being scanned with Mad Defender for us to make sure we're not uh, providing anything that it might be, I don't know, they embed, to check if there's something malicious embedding that one for them to block it, but equally important to make sure there's no false positive, let's say, in case that um, binary would be detected by an enterprise security product as well. That would be a, a problem on their own as well. Uh, the same thing that happens on the Hitachi side as well. Uh, Hitachi Energy as part of the release cycle, they're scanning with our solution as well, and they have a different flavor of our products. They are using multiple of our products to achieve that one, being in their cloud, in our cloud, uh, on-prem, in the isolated air-gapped environments, since they have a lot of different uh, environments where they're building products and they need to leverage the easiest way path forward and we have solutions for that as well. 
Uh, another one I'm really happy with is actually how um, Berlin Airport uh, is leveraging our products and it's an ICAP integration to be able to like uh, process all the files that are flowing in through their platform as well. And you can read more on our website about that one as well. Uh, a few more case studies I'm going to highlight. We have uh, one that I really like is the one we have with Zendesk, but we have a few on government and uh, on banking as well. So um, the important part here, and these are probably the main three, uh, like these are definitely our main three verticals, BFSI, Banking Financial Services Insurance, the government, and also on the um, technology side as well. Um, on government, that can be state and local education for sure, the sled business, but also we have a lot of business on the federal side. Uh, and we have um, a lot of, let's say, interest in like using our product as a filter for traffic coming in and going out, out of like sensitive environments as well, right? And that can be air gap environments, that can be secret, top secret, and so on and so forth. And um, our solution works both on-prem in your cloud, meaning AWS, Azure, uh, you name it, but also can run in like IC cloud, um, secret, top secret from Azure, and so on and so forth. And one last thought as well, like feel free to try it out. We have our uh, free edition on MedDefenderOps.com or MedDefender.com as well. You can try it both. Uh, you can actually upload the file, see what kind of results, how the analysis works, how fast it goes, and also like um, what kind of value we can provide. And again, the REST APIs are public. Feel free to check them out. But also we have a lot of, again, marketing will kill me, but it's more of like connectors, let's call them, for you to have like an easy experience to integrate part of your flows. Uh, and with that in mind, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I rushed as much as I could through the presentation. Hopefully this was uh, meaningful information and feel free to ask me any questions you might have. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, uh, George. That was fantastic information and a great presentation. I wanna remind everyone that there is a QR code right up there on the screen. So do that and then we are going to move next to our poll question, please let us know what additional information you would like to get about the OpSWAT solution. There's a bunch of choices there. So while we go through some of your fantastic questions today, please let OpSWAT know how they can help you going forward. So uh, if you're ready, uh, why don't we dive in, George? Um, let's see, first question up today, uh, the recommendation is to scan uploaded files with any virus software or a sandbox. But for this attendee, this seems to be overkill. So uh, from their perspective, why isn't Symantec enough uh, to use in the environment? Um, yeah, I think you're referring, or like uh, he, uh, this person is referring to the OWASP recommendations as part of the file upload cheat sheet, I think it's called, uh, is to actually analyze the file with an uh, antivirus or sandbox. and. This is interesting because um, part of uh, any kind of pen test, uh, they're actually checking if, um, if the file is being scanned and if a virus file is actually accepted, they're going to fail the pen test. Now, back to the actual question. Um, as I uh, tried to say before in uh, just a few words, one AV is not enough because the static detection is not good enough, right? And this is the part that a lot of blind spots for the AVs as well. And again, I'm, I'm not trying to bash any of the AVs technologies because most of them are our partners, right? Like we, OEM technology we have as part of our portfolio, but really important is the fact that there are things that are not meant for them to be able to uh, scan. The example I gave was actually the hyperlinks, right? But there are a couple more examples where by crafting in a certain way that document, by actually introducing and DDE attacks and so on in a different way, they can easily bypass that detection, right? And we have a lot of those cases. We have cases where people use Clem AVs in open source to tick that box. They got ransomware in, and then they came to like leverage our solution as well, right? And I think, again, I'm not trying to scare anyone, but I think that's the entire point where like, if you're just ticking a box, you're gonna get, um, the files are gonna get in, right? If you want to have a full solution where it actually goes through multiple stages to cover all those blind spots as well that the static detection cannot uh, perform, that's where our solution comes into play as well. Oh, got you, thanks very much. Okay, next up, uh, we have a question from Michael and he wants to know, are there end user options on what to do or what actions can be taken if OpSWAT detects a uh, threat file? Um, so depending on the integration, right? So let's say if it's a web portal and you have like a 
let's say your own UI and we just provide an answer kind of thumbs up, thumbs down, you can get back to that end user and say, hey, there's a problem with your file, please, uh, I know, re-upload the correct file or something like that. Or you can, as depend on you how much information you want to provide. Information disclosure is kind of like seen as a vulnerability, so I won't go into many details exactly what we found because you're encouraging the attacker to craft their sample better to a certain level, right? But um, when it comes to like our solutions, we definitely have a lot of enforcement capabilities put in place, right? So that's the other part that depending on the integration side, if let's say if it's in a storage unit or it's in like a SaaS product like Salesforce and so on, we have different capabilities on how we can actually enforce access that file, delete it, move it, and so on and so forth. So depending on integration, we have a, you know, a lot of different options on how we can tackle that one. But at the end of the day, you want to let the end user know there was a problem with the files and you want for them to be aware that you're blocking or removing access um, or like deleting entirely and so on if there was a problem with that file. And I want to insist on one point actually, problem with the file doesn't mean that the file itself is malicious, right? Problem with the file actually can mean like maybe you don't want to accept a particular file type, right? If I have a web portal, I don't want to accept there's a bank executables being uploaded to that web portal, right? That's an easy example. Maybe password protected files, you don't want to accept those ones, right? Uh, maybe you don't want to accept, I don't know, macros, but you want to accept JavaScript in PDFs. It's more of like what defines as a compliant file, what's within policy file versus out of policy. Hopefully that makes sense. That yeah, no, that's a really good reminder too. So I uh, have a great question. I think a lot of the attendees have that Aiden is asking. Uh, Aiden wants to know, how can AI driven threat detection be integrated without adding latency or affecting the user interface or the, I'm sorry, the user experience? So there are different, like we have AI capabilities as part of our product. We have AI engines as part of our product, right? So it's a matter of uh, always on like, what is the, I know, the risk appetite, right? Like how far you want to go and what is accepted on the end user side as a delay, right? If you want to have an, like we had a customer who was asking to have an analysis within 50 milliseconds. And I was like, you cannot even upload a, I don't know, 100 megabyte file in 50 milliseconds. I cannot, uh, I don't know, scan it and so on, right? So it needs to be realistic when it comes to like what exactly you're expecting, how fast you're expecting for those files to be analyzed. And then like what are the technologies that are better fit and how fast they can move. Now, there's a lot of uh, things that we can do with Gen AI. And, that, and I love the technology. I think that it's adding a lot of value. Right now, some of the use cases are not moving fast enough. When you want to have analysis under one second, some things might not be good enough. But for others, we implement Gen AI as part of our detection capabilities as well because it's adding value as well, right? So it's a matter for us to be able to like balance, let's say, the risk acceptance with the, um, I don't know, the speed and the user experience, right? And that's always a challenge when it comes to like how fast should we move versus how much technology and how, I don't know, what's the benefit out of that technology as well? Because if you're not moving the needle too much, but you're delaying the entire user experience, right? It's better, and this is the part I was trying to explain the sandbox side, it's better to have different triggers on when you're actually adding extra technology to analyze and AI being one of those capabilities, right? Instead of like having it in line for every file and delay the process for every user, in fact, every user experience and so on. Okay, great. Yeah, we always, uh, I, I think in every webinar these days, George, we are sort of legally required to have a question about AI in there somewhere, right? So, <laughs> so, so glad, glad we got that taken care of. Okay, I think we got time for, for, uh, for just a couple more. And here's an interesting one. Uh, this comes from Thomas who wants to know, how do you scan files when most of the time they're sent encrypted? And are you scanning them before they're being sent? So in other words, like data at rest? So we do have different flows um, where we're trying to actually, like for our solution, let's say when it comes to the platform itself, accepts the file and the pass key, pass phrase, password, whatever that might be, right? But we have different flows to be able to integrate at um, either gateway level or integration level, right? So we need to be able to get access to those ones. So like an easy example, maybe on the email side, you get an email with the pass protected file. We're gonna hold that email and we're gonna send you different emails saying, hey, you received this email from this context, some details there. 
you need to input the password, uh, like go to this one to input your password, and then you can actually have access to uh, the decrypted file, or like we can re-encrypt it as well if you want, but we need the passphrase for us to be able to unencrypt it. Now, there's things that we're able to do, like try to find the password in the email body as well, but if we cannot able to do that, that would be a better way to use it, right? Um, there are different mechanisms, especially on data address, it's a little bit more difficult because we don't have the concept of a user. So we're trying to find different flows and we have different mechanisms in our product, depending on the application on how they can provide that one. So some of them are actually building their own flows to call our API with the password as well. Some of them are giving us a dictionary of like uh, predefined um, passwords and so on and so forth. In general, especially let's say if it's like an S3 integration, um, ideally we're using something like client-side encryption and they're giving us uh, a reference to the KMS, which is the key for the client-side encryption. We're using that one to decrypt and analyze the files, right? Instead of like going through password protected and like having a password for each of the files, or we have a different key for each of the file and they're giving us what's the key as a tag or something like that. So we have different mechanisms to achieve that one. It's a lot of complexity. I know I'm going all over the places, but there's a lot of complexity when it comes to each integration and each uh, different flow, but we have enough flexibility to accommodate all that. Exactly. And um, another thing that's great about everything you're talking about is that there's kind of no lock in of, of any kind here. I mean, you know, it's your your environment that that OpSWAT adapts to meet. So um, so that is just fantastic information. Now, I have put the um, the, the previous slide up there again because I want that QR code up there so uh, folks can reach out to OpSWAT um, ASAP. We have generated so many questions today, uh, George, you have really struck a nerve with your presentation. There's so much interest and engagement with the audience. Uh, I want to thank you for being on with us today and for your fantastic presentation and the insights in the Q&A. It's been a pleasure to be on with you. Thank you much, everyone. Thank you very much for your time as well. Appreciate it. And with that, folks, I'm going to leave this up for another second while I uh, do one of my favorite parts of every event we do, and that is giving out a gift card. We have got the first $300 Amazon gift card ready to go today. As uh, we mentioned up at the beginning, you do have to be in attendance during the entire event to be eligible to win the prizes. And the winner of the first $300 card today is Gary Lieberman from Pennsylvania. Congratulations to you, Gary. We will be in touch about claiming your prize. And with that, folks, it is now time for our second slash uh, final presentation in the EcoCast today. This one comes from our great friends over at Rubrik. Presenting for Rubrik today is a sales engineer, Robert West. Robert is ready to go. Robert, it is great to have you here today. Good to see you. I am going to turn this over to you now. You have the Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Robert West. I'm a sales engineer here at Rubrik based out of Austin, Texas. Today, we're going to be discussing Rubrik's offerings for securing your, securing your cloud environments. All right, so here are some of the objectives I'm going to talk you through in regards to some of the key challenges uh, you may be facing when it comes to data protection in the cloud. Then we'll talk about how Rubrik can step in and help. At the end of the presentation, I'll walk you through a brief tour of our Polaris platform where we make all this possible from a single pane of glass. First things first, let's do a brief level set on Rubrik and the core value proposition of our platform, where it really all begins. First, we modernize the way that traditional legacy backup is done through our single scale out software um, fabric approach built on a 2U4 node hyperconverged appliance on prem which drastically consolidates and simplifies the way that core backup is done. We support all enterprise apps for this workflow with an API first platform that is secure and flexible to automate um, driven essentially by our SLAs. Out of the box, it's natively immutable through our append only Atlas file system. So once data is written to rubric, it can't be edited, overwritten, encrypted, et cetera. We also provide a logical air gap uh, by not presenting rubric over the network via standard network protocols like NFS or SMB. Instead, every communication is done with secure APIs. Second, what we will mostly be talking about today is that our platform natively extends to the cloud. Our software was designed in the cloud era 
with cloud in mind, um, where we can dynamically move data to the cloud, spin things up in the cloud, take a VM and archive it to the cloud and protect cloud native assets. Last but not least, where we're going and our vision as a company is to deliver additional business value beyond just the core backup layer. We provide additional insights with use cases like cyber resiliency and data governance by making use of the backup metadata that we ingest. So think of monitoring snapshots for any anomalous changes or finding out exactly where sensitive data like credit cards and social security numbers might be out in the open. Um, and we also provide you with threat hunting capabilities so that our customers can scan, ex scan existing snapshots for ind indicators of compromise to help signal when an infection likely started in the first place. And that's the core platform in general. But let's jump back in and why we're here. And that is to talk about the cloud and the challenges to managing and protecting that data. So here's a checklist and what we're trying to solve for here. Uh, three things. The first quite fitting for today is figuring out how do I solve for the cloud? We find that enterprises are, are trying to solve for data management in a hybrid architecture. So that means they're adopting new cloud platforms and even deploying multiple cloud platforms to achieve a lot of different things unique to that specific organization. Secondly, customers we talk to are trying to make it easier to run their digital estate. Automation is a key tenant to our operational efficiencies. So when thinking about your next data management solution, it's something that must be easy to automate and integrate into your existing environment. Last, but certainly not least, is tackling the security risk. Data security and being able to recover from ransomware plus data governance are top of mind for really everyone. A data management solution would be incomplete if, not, uh, if it did not provide recovery capabilities for cyber attacks and region failures. Another problem that comes into play and has to do with the shared responsibility model, where one part of the setup is the responsibility of the cloud provider, and another part of it is the responsibility of the customer. But no matter what, when it comes to security, it's always going to fall in the lap of the customer. And, that, and because of that, they are seeking out well-architected cloud solutions. And because of this, it can become especially tricky if you're hybrid, multi-cloud, or operating at an enormous scale whether it's infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or software as a service apps. And here's the main challenge for those with existing workloads in the cloud. A typical cloud architecture often involves tens if not hundreds of different account subscriptions um, across many different clouds and regions, which combined with manual job scheduling um, or painful scripting, it can really drain the product productivity from IT teams. In the field, we're hearing from, um, from some of our prospects that they're having to set up all these different components around things like retention and frequency, uh, then having to deploy resource, resources within multiple regions for each account, where now you have to manage backup screen, uh, schemes across all these different regions. However, at Rubrik, we can help you solve this and ensure that your data is backed up and protected no matter where it sits in the cloud. Our platform can tie in regardless of where your organization is in its cloud journey, whether you're 90% on-prem and have a deadline to be in the cloud in the next six to 12 months, or you're born in the cloud and building all your apps uh, there. Um, so, you know, we can definitely extend security and governance to the cloud for you. Our customers are all on a journey to the cloud and thus far, um, this is what we have helped them solve. Uh, Rubrik makes it easy to archive backup data to low cost, uh, low cost uh, storage in the cloud. We can also help orchestrate their existing applications into the cloud to accelerate their move away from on-premise infrastructure. And we also help to ensure their new cloud native workloads are protected. First up, archival. Most customers, if they have uh, an on-prem data center and have replaced a legacy solution with Rubrik, will take an archive uh, of their uh, backup data and send it to the public cloud, uh, maybe something like an AWS S3 bucket or Azure Blob. Our technology does incremental forever in the archive piece. So it's efficient um, with how we're placing the data in the cloud bucket. We can also automate that lifecycle of how the data tiers and when it tiers based on policies and storage class. 
This is all controlled within our SLA policy domain to dictate when and where you want your data archived. Because again, of all the metadata and how it's indexed, it's searchable. And if you need to pull back data out of the archive with our software, um, you can retrieve singular files without pulling the whole VM back. So if you had an archive living in an S3 IA and frequent access bucket, but maybe there's a document you've been asked to pull from three months ago, which is no longer in production, it's in the backup. Or let's say you want to set up an SLA policy that says you want to take snapshots every six hours, keep that data local on the appliance for 30 days, but then you also have a retention requirement of two years. You can then set up the SLA policy to reflect this uh, need. So data after it's been retained locally for 30 days can automate, automatically get pushed up to the least expensive tier in the cloud. We also, of course, uh, offer an encryption, 256-bit uh, at rest and at flight. Next up, cloud instantiation. Uh, this is a feature of ours that we call Cloud On, uh, which is only available currently for AWS and Azure. Customers protecting their on-prem workloads using Rubrik usually implement this for things like disaster recovery, app migration, or an accelerated test dev environment from their existing snapshots on the appliance. Technically speaking, what, that, what this does is it supports conversion on an on-prem VM to an EC2 instance in AWS or, um, or, or a VM in Azure. Irrespective of whether it's a, if the snapshot's available locally on the brick or has already been archived to AWS or Azure. It does this by converting the VMDK to an AMI for AWS or a VHD uh, for Azure from which an instance can be launched in the cloud. Rubrik supports two workflows for convert, uh, converting and instantiating um, um, an on-premise VM in the cloud. We can do it on demand, providing flexibility of a good RPO, as an end user can go back in time on any snapshot and hit the launch in the cloud button, um, or you could choose to schedule this conversion. Once that is enabled, the cloud on job will execute every two hours by default and convert the latest snapshot, um, last point in time snapshot to that particular image format. Last up is cloud native protection. This is delivered as a service uh, based snapshotting tool available through Polaris GPS, which we'll touch on, which I'll show you here in a bit. Um, this software is used to protect workloads that are infrastructure as a service or platform as a service in the cloud. Because some customers, after they've lifted and shifted or they built uh, things cloud native, they want to make sure that they can provide the same level of governance and security. First of all, for this capability, um, it's software as a service from a configuration standpoint. There's no running resources like compute nodes or anything like that uh, in your cloud account. All we're doing is connecting via API from our console, which is an aggregation of metadata. It's a control plane, if you will. We connect from that control plane via API to your cloud account and you're off and running. Implementation um, usually only takes several minutes. Um, so it's, it's very quick to set up and consume. For scalable protection, we offer the ability to create a policy that spans hundreds of thousands of resources in the cloud by simply telling um, telling what kind of RPO and RTO you want. For instance, you could say, I want to be able to back up all of my cloud resources, whether it's RDS workloads or EC2 one, once a day. I want to retain that data for 15 days and then archive it out somewhere else. You could set that policy up and the software handles the entire backup and recovery process. We take a lot of the manual work out of having to go configure all these different components in the cloud. And 90% of the clients we talk to tell us that their cloud teams are launching and building things in the cloud really fast. And most times it's challenging for them to get a baseline backup and be able to prove to both themselves and internal and external stakeholders that the data is protected. And through the SLA domain, it makes it very easy um, to always ensure that you have a baseline backup. From a recovery standpoint, it's near zero RTO to several clicks to recover. You can cover things across region and account in the cloud. Everything is searchable and we present you with that data back very quickly. In terms of security, a logical air gap provides 
protection from ransomware, keeping your backups data isolated and safe uh, in the case of compromise. And from a usability standpoint, we purposely developed a no-brainer approach. We have a point and click multi-cloud dashboard experience that the operator can go into, derive reporting from, have visibility, plain and simple, uh, in a way that you know, some uh, native tooling from cloud provider cannot do. And then from the cloud builders or DevOps folks, we have the ability to deploy this as a code uh, with a dedicated Terraform provider uh, like we used, uh, like we talked about earlier. So you can auto provision rubric up and down as you're launching cloud templates across different resources in AWS and Azure. It's really flexible in how to manage um, and, and that's our cloud native uh, protection at a high level. Lastly, I do want to show that we cover and protect a broad range of workloads, the most popular being EC2 instances, Azure VMs, VMware Cloud, SQL, and M365, just to name a few. We actually announced back in August of last year that we teamed up with Microsoft uh, to co-engineer some projects with them, which in fact included backing up and protecting M365, um, which includes, of course, Exchange, OneDrive, SharePoint, and Teams. It's all derived as a service and the backups are hosted inside our own Azure tenant, providing customers with that logical air gap and the operational freedom that comes with rubric managing that setup in the end. I would actually love to show you this real quick when we jump into Polaris. And having said that, I'm gonna go ahead and dive into Polaris GPS really quickly. Bear with me for a second, folks. So this is Polaris GPS. This is that SaaS based platform that I've been talking about. Um, think of it as the manager of managers um, as it pertains to rubric. It's pulling in all the telemetry data that you're protecting with the rubric, whether it be on-prem um, or cloud native for Azure, AWS, GCP, or SaaS based for M365. So for OneDrive, Exchange, SharePoint, and Teams to give you a single aggregated view of your entire uh, environment that you're protecting with rubric. Uh, as it pertains to M365 or cloud native, it's very easy to set up. Um, so we're going to go to our M365 offering here. You would click add subscription, put in your global admin permissions for OneDrive, SharePoint, Exchange, and Teams. Um, at no point would we store those credentials. Uh, we use modern authentication, so OAuth 2.0, um, to create that secure sync with your M365 estate. Um, and at that point, um, you can start creating these SLAs and protecting these particular objects. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to assign SLA domain. For the sake of this demo, I'm just gonna assign an SLA or show you the process of assigning an SLA just to exchange, but know that you can assign a single SLA across all the objects in M365. You can also get very granular and assign it at the user level as well. So we're gonna click next. Out of the solution, you'll have a gold, a silver, and a bronze SLA, but you can certainly create your own. And I'll walk you through that workflow right now. We can click create. And then on the left, we're going to be looking at RPOs. On the right, we're going to look at uh, retention. So with M365, we can take snapshots every four hours. So say we want to hang on to the, that for three days, let's say a daily, hang on to that for 30 days, let's say a monthly for 12 months. Again, this is uh, completely customizable based on your requirements. We're then gonna click next, review the SLA of everything look good. We click create, and we would start protecting that environment or that exchange object. From a recovery standpoint, it's super easy. The workflow is the same, whether it's on-prem uh, M365 or cloud native, um, you're gonna be presented with this, cloud, uh, this calendar view here in a second when I go to the user that I wanna recover. And then we see the SLA that's assigned to this particular user, um, which again can be at the object level or the user level. Um, so if we go back to, let's say the 12th and we wanna recover, click recover. We can either recover Aaron's entire mailbox to himself or to another user if Aaron has exited the organization, or we can crack open um, his mailbox and recover specific components. 
Um, we also have the ability to provide you with a Google like search functionality to search based on the actual title of the email or attachment to locate that specific email and then provide you with various recovery options as well. The same recovery options, original user to another user. Later this year, you also have the ability to download locally to your browser. That workflow is very similar across the board, whether it's uh, Exchange, OneDrive, SharePoint, or Teams. Uh, we do have a couple, we have that re download locally um, option uh, for OneDrive, SharePoint, and Teams. Um, and again, that's on the roadmap for Exchange. Um, as it pertains to Cloud Native, let's go to all, and we can see all the objects we're currently protecting within this um, rubric demo environment. So I'll just choose um, Azure specifically for the sake of this demo. Obviously we protect VMs and applications, um, SQL databases, as well as managed SQL instances. And with, you know, with these two offerings here, we provide point in, top, point in time recovery, getting you down to the second uh, granularity when it comes to recover. Again, very easy to set up. Uh, you put in your global admin permissions for all of your cloud accounts and we auto discover your environment and provide you with a singular view of all your various accounts. Um, once we do that auto discovery, we can start with manage protection. Uh, so we're going to select these particular VMs. Before we jump into creating that SLA, we click this ellipses here and it gives you some, um, some, some options for configuring, right? So we can do file level recovery. Um, so it, it does require some compute to be spun up when we take those, uh, it's exocompute, so it's not always running, but whenever we take that first full backup and then every subsequent incremental backup will spin up a uh, small exocompute um, within your environment uh, to, to allow that file level recovery and then we'll spin it right back down, super cost effective. Um, also out of the, you know, the solution is going to be in a crash consistent uh, state. Um, from recover, you know, from our backup perspective, but you can enable um, you can enable app consistency. Um, does require agent, but because of this, we'll capture all the uh, the data within memory too um, for that specific VM. So when we click manage protection, again you have that gold, silver, and bronze, and if you hover over them, it'll tell you exactly what the RPO and retention is. But then you know we can obviously uh, create an SLA from scratch. So I'm going to select the object I want to protect with this particular SLA. On the left, we're looking at our RPOs. On the right, retention again. So say I want to take a snapshot every one hour, hang on it for two days, a daily for 30 days, and then a monthly for 12 months. We're then going to click Next. We have the ability to enable archiving. So um, you know, at a certain point in time, which you dictate, we'll tear that off to you know, very cheap, deep storage for long-term retention. Um, I do not have a storage account associated with Azure apparently um, in this particular demo, so I cannot do that at this time, but you do have that option. We now can enable replication. So we select the region we want to replicate to. And then we tell the system how long we want that data to sit at that secondary site before aging out. Click next. If everything looked good, you click create. Now this is a demo environment and I have uh, limited access uh, uh, permissions that I'm granted here, so I cannot do it, but it's really that simple. And then lastly, before we uh, conclude this, uh, this demo here, I just wanna show you um, our recovery options. So if I pick on this, I'll just select this VM here at the bottom. Again, you're gonna see that same workflow. We have that calendar view. We see the SLA that's assigned to it. And when we go to recovery, um, I see, I chose this one because we do have uh, indexing available, so I can search. It's on the file name to locate specific files. And when I go to recover, I can recover specific files, traverse the folder hierarchy. I've provided, you know, rubric provides that Google like search functionality. We can restore the existing VM uh, from this snapshot, or we can export to another region or account. Uh, it's really that simple. Unfortunately, I'm coming up on time here, um, but if you'd like to see a deep dive on rubric and all its capabilities, please reach out to your rubric sales team or your vendor of choice uh, with how you uh, procure technology and they'll get that call set up for you. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate it.
And we appreciate your time, Robert. Thank you so much for that presentation uh, and really love the super in-depth demo. That always resonates with me and with the attendees usually too. We like seeing how these things work. Uh, gives us a much better idea of what it can do. Um, and now I have put up the final poll question of the event and we want you to let us know what additional resources you would like to see from rubric looks like we had a lot of questions coming in from everyone uh, i wanted to mention that robert cannot take questions today but he and the entire rubric team will do their best to respond to all the questions that came in now while you continue voting in the poll i'd also like to remind everyone about the handouts there is a pdf from rubric that is an illuminating white paper on a trusted data security solution for cyber recovery Check that out for more detail. Uh, like all of our handouts, it is free to you to download. You have another few minutes to check those out. So I encourage you to do that now, along with continuing to vote in the poll. We do appreciate that feedback as always. And while we continue to wrap up that voting, I'm going to give away the final two $300 Amazon gift cards for the event. And the winners of those are Eugene Hong, from California and Jordan Olmsted from Oregon. Congratulations to all of our winners today. Sit tight folks and you will be hearing from us. Now, uh, I, am, I have sure enjoyed this EcoCast today and if you have too, well, you should consider having us do one of these for you. We would love to hear from you to help you determine which of our hundreds of events each year would be a good fit for you. We have these sorts of uh, eco-casts. We have got mega-casts. We've got summits. We have got webinars, which are specific to the, uh, to the vendor. Uh, we can tune that for you specifically. So we have lots of ways to get your presentation out there. So let us know. Send us an email to connect at actualtechmedia.com so we can start that conversation. Speaking of virtual summits, which I mentioned a moment ago, I wanted to let you know that we have one of those coming up tomorrow on a topic of great importance. Looking ahead all the way to 2030 and understanding what you will need to do to prepare. It is not too early to start thinking about those things. It'll be honest before you know it. So that summit is starting tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern. I wanted to mention that specifically because most of our events like this start at noon. This is an hour earlier than normal tomorrow. So it starts at 8 a.m. For those of you on Pacific time, set your alarm clocks, folks, so you can be ready for that. And uh, please sign up for that right after the event is over today. And that is going to be in just a minute. Folks, on behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, we are wrapped for today. I want to thank all of our presenters for putting together the fantastic presentations that you've seen, the demos, the Q&A insights. I want to thank OpSWAT and Rubrik specifically for making this whole thing possible. Without them, this doesn't happen. And finally, to the attendees, thank you for being here with us, with me, for uh, reaching out and engaging. Uh, I always enjoy spending time with you. Can't wait to see you in the next event. And that concludes uh, everything for today, folks. I will see you soon. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.